good. Enjoyable worship this morning, yeah? I was, I was talking to my friend in the back there, right? That first that first old uh, Hillsong song, Hillsong, Maranatha song. Has Multnomah Falls in the background in Oregon. I but anybody's ever been to Multnomah Falls. It's beautiful, right? Beautiful Multnomah Falls. So um, I, I've been uh, I've been thinking the last uh, couple of weeks about the thought of how God commands us to obey, and I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like much fun. That I'm I'm commanded to obey, and I, I have this kind of maybe wrong image in my head sometimes about how you know would you just do what I say and just 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 do your duty right do your job just obey and sometimes I maybe I'm the only one but sometimes I have this you know like little redneck rebellious nature coming up inside of me and says what obey you just want me to obey and uh, I was reading in John I'm in I'm in John in my in the Bible I'm reading this year the the passion translation and it struck me as I was in I was in uh, John chapter 14 and it just kind of s- struck me how often this is the vocabulary of Jesus. But Jesus in his conversation about his relationship with the Father. And in, in John 14, starting in verse 15. Uh, Loving me empowers you to obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another Savior, the Holy Spirit of truth, who will be your friend just like me. And he will never leave you. The world will receive, won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you will know him intimately because he will make his home in you and will live inside of you. So Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the purpose is, is that he's going to help you to obey my commandments. He's going to make this, he's going to give you a new nature inside that your nature is going to naturally respond to want to obey. And what does Jesus say of himself? He says, well, you know, I'm modeling for you what it means to be a great kid. Because I only do what I see the Father do. Right? I do exactly what he says for me to do. I am so obedient. I'm obedient, and we'll read the scripture in a little bit in Philippians. One of my favorite scriptures says, I'm obedient even to the death of the cross. I'm obedient all the way to the death. That's how obedient I am as a child to his Father. And then I'm looking at me, right? Who's kind of like, right? what? Obey? You know, you feel restricted by, by a command to obey can feel restricted right because because there's something inside of us that that kind of wants to be the boss right that wants to be the captain of our own ship and the maker of our own destiny and it goes this way because I act on it and there's some redemptive part of that in that God made us to be creative like he's creative he made us to speak things as that are not as though they were and to speak and declare things as we speak according to his will so there's there's good in that but But there's the other side of it that's like, well, you're speaking things according to his will. I'm speaking things as a child submitted to his father, just like Jesus is submitted to his father. And here in John 14, he's saying, you know, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit with that express intent to help you naturally obey the father. And then over uh, in verse 21, those who truly love me are those who obey my commands. Whoever passionately loves me will be, will be passionately loved by my Father, and I will passionately love you in return and will manifest my life within you. So if you really love me, you keep my commandments. Then down in verse 23, Jesus replied, Loving me empowers you to obey my word. Loving me empowers you to obey my word, and my Father will love you so deeply that we will come to you and make our dwelling place in, in you. But those who don't love me will not obey my words. The Father did not send me to speak my own revelation, but the words of my Father. I am telling you this while I am still with you, but when the Father sends his spirit of holiness, the one like me who sets you free, he will teach you all things in my name, and he will inspire you to remember every word that I have told you. Obey, 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 and I'll send you the Holy Spirit to help you obey then down in uh, all the way down to verse 30 I won't speak with you much longer for the ruler of this dark world is coming but he has no power over me for he has nothing to use against me I'm doing exactly what the father destined for me to accomplish so that the world would discover how much I love my father 
the world's going to see how much I love my father by me doing exactly what he does. I'm going to so model obedience for you that everybody's going to see how much I love my father. Chapter 15. It carries on. Chapter 15. <clears throat> Starting in verse 9. I love each of you with the same love that the father loves me. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commandments, you will live in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, for I continually live nourished and empowered by his love. Is that, is that beautiful? If you keep my commandments, you will live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, for I continually live nourished and empowered by his love. My purpose for telling you these things is so that you're so that the joy that I experience will fill your hearts with overflowing gladness. So I so love the Father, and I demonstrate it by my obedience. And the byproduct of that is I have so much joy, and I want you to participate and enjoy that too. Because I get to live nourished by my Father's love every day, and I get to reflect that back and demonstrate to him how much I love him by obeying exactly what he says to do. And the byproduct of that in my life is overwhelming joy that I want you to participate in. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like a drudgery at all, does it? That sounds a pretty awesome place to live. And uh, so reading this over the last couple of days, um, made me want to think more and reflect on this for my own life too. To say, how is it that love and obedience like are used synonymously. Jesus is saying, I love the Father, and here's how I show it. Here's how you know that I love my Father. I just get to bathe in the presence of my Father who demonstrates his love constantly for me, and how does exactly God demonstrate his love for me? And what's the natural byproduct of that in my life to reflect that back to this God who pours such overwhelming, amazing love into my life? His obedience the same as love? I, is obedience a drudgery? Is obedience a, a duty? Or is obedience a byproduct of expressing back to him all that he has expressed to us? So I thought it'd be fun to talk about this a little while this morning. And it's, it's uh, um, my prayer is, is that by the end of this message that there's some Holy Spirit has done something in bringing revelation to us about the nature and character of God. I think it's the whole enchilada, having a right revelation of the nature and character of God. I think it's everything. I think it changes everything about how we live our day-to-day -day lives, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a sec. Just want to remind you from last week, we talked, uh, or a week before last, we talked about Jesus' duty, and he had these three tasks in mind, to proclaim the release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, and set free those who are oppressed. Right? We talked about that two weeks ago, and that's exactly what Pastor Kim led us in this morning. Would you lay your hands on your eyes? Would you lay your hands on your mind? Would you lay hands on your heart? Would you just participate in what Jesus actually came to do in setting captives free and to seeing you healed, delivered, and set free? Because all this conversation that we're going to talk about today about the, the, the relationship that we have with him and the relationship to love and obedience and the revelation we have of his nature and character means that we emulate him. The byproduct of that is, is that what we just read, that these characteristics are the things that naturally become our lifestyle as well. So John 14 and 15, we just uh, read those in the Passion Translation. So, so number one, the story of love and obedience begins with truth. The, the study and the story of love and obedience begins with truth. Walking in truth results in walking in light. And walking in truth in the light, the Bible says, will set you free. The truth will set you free. Anybody ready for walking in more liberty today? We need to be rightly related to the nature and character of our Father. And we need that revelation to happen in our lives so that we walk, have a revelation of that truth. And as we have a revelation of that truth and we begin to walk, it says that our path is, will be lit by the Holy Spirit. He's going to illuminate our path. He's going to bring light into our life, but it's in the context of relationship to truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, 
and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth. He doesn't say that I have the I have the answer and I can point you to the way. He doesn't say, I have revelation and more wisdom and knowledge to impart to you, and so I can give some knowledge to you, so here, follow me, let me be your teacher. He says, I am the way. There's like, he's saying that this is my, this is my nature. This is who I am. I am truth. I am the way. This is who I am. God wants to introduce us this morning to, maybe it's, Maybe it's all old news for all of you, but he wants to bring a greater revelation to who he really is. And this is why our relationship to the truth is the context with which we have a conversation about love and obedience. Because when we encounter the truth, it has to mean something. When you come encounter with the truth, it has to change you. So for illustration purposes. So uh, we saw these experiments and this whole theory of gravity and a guy take up a bowling ball and a smaller ball drop them from the highest building right so we would all probably accept as truth that when you drop an object from a tall building it falls and then you can calculate that speed and you can drop a feather and you can drop a bowling ball together and you can you can you know study all the differences and why they fall at a different rate and you can you can you can you can create formulas on this and it's really but we'd probably all be in agreement that if I took us up to the tallest building and dropped us off the building that we're going to fall, and that fall is all fun until you get to the bottom. It's not the fall, it's the stop at the end, so they say, right? It's, the, it's, that, last, it's that last little moment that, that takes the fun out of the fall. But we'd, we'd agree that that's a truth, that when you, when you drop something from a tall building, it falls. And yet Jesus, uh, when Satan tempted Jesus, he took Jesus up to the tallest building and says, hey, jump off, right? Because the word says that if that if you were to, that God's not going to allow his favored one, he's not going to allow his, he's not going to allow him to even stub his toe, right? He's not going to allow him to break his foot on. There's nothing that's going to happen, right, if you just throw yourself off. So it's kind of like this interesting conversation about truth. So it's true that if you drop a heavy object off a tall building, you're probably, it's probably going to hurt, right? If you jump off this building, it's probably going to hurt. But then, but then Satan is using something that's more true to tempt Jesus into jumping off the building. And what's more true? Well, the, what's more true is that if God's in this equation, then, then whatever Isaac Newton said maybe isn't so necessarily the truth. Maybe there's something that's higher. Maybe there's a truth that's more true than that if you drop a high, heavy object from a tall building, it's going to fall, right? And, and so that's what Satan's saying. I think, hey, this is more true because, look, God said it. And Jesus says back to him, he says, well, you know, that's true that that's more true. But you know what's even more true is that you don't, you don't tempt the Lord your God, right? I don't just sit out there and say, okay, well, I'm just going to test you, and I'm just going to see if you will, if you're going to keep your word. Why? Because we know he's going to keep his word. Because there isn't a question in Jesus' mind about what the nature and character of his father is. He doesn't call that into doubt and then say, okay, well, let's just see if maybe it's true. So there's a true statement made, and then there's a truer statement made, and then there's a truer statement than the true statement. It's like layers of truth. And this is why tr the idea of truth needs to change us. If I take you up to the tall building and I say, I'm going to give you a little shove from the tall building, that truth of the reality of that fall is going to impact how you live. You're probably going to build a rail around that tall building, and you're probably going to make sure you're holding on to something if I bring you a little close to the rail. And if, I, if you anticipate it, you're probably going to make some defensive moves to say, you know what, I know what's true, and I'm going to act accordingly. So, it's, so it is the case that when we get a revelation of who God really is, it has to change us. There is an obligation when we, f when we learn something to be true, there is something that has to change in us to orient ourselves to that truth. And God's like saying, you know what, let's just, let's just say, what does that compass needle respond to? And let's just calibrate it this morning and remind ourselves of what the nature and character of this God that we serve is. And let our relationship with truth, who is a person, not just a knowledge. I kind of like, I kind of relate to this idea that 
I'm going to learn something that's more true. I'm going to add to my knowledge, which is all good. But God's saying, I want to introduce you to the truth. I want you to know what is true. I want you to know me who is true. Two John verses three through six. So the context of this is um, refers to her as this this woman that 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 they're, he's corresponding with, and he's he's saying, you know what? I've been watching, I've been observing what's going on in your life and the way you're raising your children. And here's what he says: I was very glad to find that some of your children were walking in the truth, just as we have received commandment to do just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. So you see that the the connection to the truth and the observation that they're walking in the truth is, I see that you're obeying the commands of God. And I see that in your children. I see that there's a relationship between you and the father that's pretty great. And I'm so honoring you because you're, even some of your kids are walking in that truth. And I can observe they're walking in the truth because they're following his commandments. Connection between truth and the commandments. But there's still this fact that obedience is a command. Obedience is a Obedience is a command. So here's some scriptures on that. Deuteronomy 11.1, 1, back in the Old Testament, back to the very beginning. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and always keep his charge, his statutes, his ordinance, and his commandments. 1 John 5.3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Really? Okay. So love and obedience are interconnected. They're used interchangeably. James says the same thing, right? If you, if you want to show me your faith, I'll show you my works, right? There's, they're like there's not a conflict here. Faith as a revelation of God's truth, a revelation of God's truth in nature, will show in your behavior. And your behavior is going to look like obeying God's commands. So how is it and why is it that love and obedience are used interchangeably? Matthew 28 more commands. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So in the, in the Great Commission, we often mention that God called us to go and disciple nations. But what are you discipling the nations in? Discipling the nations and obeying whatsoever I have commanded you. Again, is it like this, this love and obedience but, but, you know, it just said that, it's, that his commandments are not a drudgery. They're not burdensome. So maybe we need a little bit, a little bit more insight and revelation about God's nature and the nature of his commands. So is it really that big a deal that, that God commands? And, and, I, and I, how am I doing in this, following these commands? And how much attention do I put to these commands? And, and is it really that big a deal in my life? John, 1 John 2, 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commands is a liar. Darn. And the truth is not in him. So you got the connection between the truth and the revelation of the truth and who is truth and who is the way and who is the light and the commandments again. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Ha! Huh. And the truth is not in him. If I don't, if I don't, as a byproduct of the new nature inside of me, if I don't naturally obey, if I don't naturally do what my father does, if I don't naturally do what Jesus did in modeling for me right relationship with the Father, that I'm a liar and the truth is not in me. God, help me to have a revelation of your truth. There's. There's something that you're wanting to do inside of me because this seems like it's, it's supposed to be a natural byproduct of my revelation of your truth. That when I, when I get it, that it changes me. That when I get it, it's not just academic. That when I get it, it changes me in my relationship to you. 
2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. Yet perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So I'm in this conflict, and I, 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 I feel it rising up inside of me. You know, this, this, this conflict. Yesterday, I was just sharing with somebody earlier, I, I felt it twice rise up in me just yesterday. <laughs> you know, once in the morning, once in the night. <sighs> you know, you just feel. You just feel it coming up, and, and yet God puts us in a place of choosing which spirit we're going to be influenced by. And gratefully, I, gratefully it was only a moment, and, I, and, I, and I, let, I let God's spirit move me to consistency with this verse instead of where I might have gone. But it comes up inside all the time, and I think that for us, often when this choice comes, there's, there really is a moment of decision there. Sometimes our emotions are so so charged and so impulsive that we don't actually notice that there's a choice in there. But there's a choice in there where God gives us an opportunity to say, okay, which spirit am I going to be influenced by? This new nature that is a reflection of God's nature and God's truth or something lesser. But this, this is a really neat verse because when we're engaging this, this discrepancy, God tells us, he says, if perhaps, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. It's like there's this moment of illumination that comes when I get to know the nature and character of this God that has poured out such incredible love for me. God's saying, I, I, I don't want you to just obey. I want you to know me. And when you know me and you have a revelation of my nature and character, that results in obedience. Still not quite sure I own it, but I, but, I, but I get it, right? I get the expression of God's love for me, and that a natural expression of God's love for me should be to reflect that back and to respond to his love towards me. But there's something more here to this, to this obedience thing that I still tend to... Right? There's something more that God wants to bring revelation on. So, number two. Number one is, is that the relationship to this whole conversation about obedience is, has to do with our relationship to truth. Second thing, how does God demonstrate his love towards us? So, I think that's a, that's a pretty awesome thing to look at. So, how does God demonstrate his love towards us? Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so just to, like, picture that. This in a conversation yesterday. Jesus is on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And nobody would ask for forgiveness. Right? They're in the middle of murdering him. And Jesus says, while they're in their sin... While you're in your sin, while you're, while, you're, while you're not at your best, right? Your oral hygiene is not so great, right? While you're not looking your best, right, first thing in the morning, that, that, that we're not putting our best before God. We're still in our sin, which is, God, you're not enough. I want this substitute because this makes me feel better. I want, my, I want this more than I want you. And I... I think that I want you, and that looks really good, but I'm really still, uh, my needs seem to be being met by this counterfeit over here, and so I think I love that more than I love you. And God says that in that state, he says, I'll pay the ultimate price. I'll make the ultimate expression of love to you, and I'll give my life to you. I'll be faithful all the way to the cross, and I'll give my life for you. And in fact, I'll say I'll forgive you a thousand years before you're, you even ask. How, how, how do we do at extending forgiveness and grace that quickly? Like years ahead of time. 
How about you do it right now, right? We'll extend that grace and forgiveness so that anything you might do in the future towards me, I've already forgiven you, right? God's grace and mercy is so profound in my life that for me to then take what God gave me and then withhold it from you would be an ultimate insult to God who did that for me 2,000 years before I made my first choice. He already made that decision. Didn't have anything to do with my response. All had to do with his expression of love and his demonstration of love towards me. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. How does God, our point is, how does God demonstrate his love towards us? Philippians 2, 6 through 8, love this section of scripture, one of my favorites. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond servant. And being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of the death, even the death on the cross. So, clearly, this is, this is talking about Jesus and that God sent his son. And we didn't mention John 3.16, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God sets this stage, and then he himself, in the, that member of the Godhead, the Son, demonstration of God, God and Jesus, and, and yet Jesus is doing only what he sees the Father do. So this scripture, we're reading it because this is Jesus who made that choice, but Jesus is only doing what he sees the Father do. So we can learn an awful lot about what God does to demonstrate his love towards us by just seeing that Jesus is doing whatever he sees the Father do, right? And it's talking about he's obedient even to the death of the cross. So, so Jesus is being obedient to the Father, and that's kind of cool. I mean, I, I, I got that, right? He's modeling for us how to be the best son ever, the best kid ever in relationship to his Father. But, but when you think about the Father, who is the Father obeying? I mean, if, if obedience is connected to expression of love, then who's God obeying? Exactly. Right? God is obeying himself. Because God's nature and his character is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God chooses to express his love towards us consistent with his nature and character without fail every time, 100% of the time. Regardless of what you or I do. 100% of the time he's consistent and true to his nature and character and the laws that he's established for the whole world to govern, but be governed by these these natural laws that just are because they're, they're by our creator, created by our creator and makes them self-evident by just observing all that's around us, Romans chapter 1. He's made it all true. And he is consistent with himself. So in a sense, Jesus is obedient to the Father, but the Father is also obedient to the Father. And he says, this is how I express my love towards you. I obey my own laws, I become the form of a servant. The God of the universe becomes in the form of a servant who shows and manifests his love to you by serving you, by laying down his life for you, and then saying, obey my commands. And what does he command you to do? He commands you to do the same thing to one another. He says, dude, right, if you're not showing that love for each other, then this is just an academic joke. We're not into the academic. We're into how do we demonstrate the love of God? How do we receive his love towards us? And then how do we demonstrate that to one another? And it's about this revelation and this, this context of the nature and character of our God that reveals himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And that truth needs to change us. I love that scripture. Emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant because he's looking like dad. And dad takes on the form of a bondservant. Doesn't take on the form of, right, it's my way or the highway and I'm going to zap you if you don't obey. He says, I love, I serve, I, I show the greatest of friendship, right? Greater love is no man than this and lay down his life for his friends. And, and he's consistent with his nature and character. Pretty cool. So God demonstrated his love for us by humbling himself, taking on the form of servant, become obedient unto death. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for modeling your nature and character in such a profound way to us that's just only 180 degrees from the way we think it should be. 
of what somebody should rule. And this idea of how much religion has changed the nature and character of God to make us think of him something that's inconsistent with his nature and character. And that also changes you. If you think God is, is this tyrannical God who just says it's my way or the highway and doesn't express himself in the form of a servant, in the form of unconditional crazy love, and that's your nature and character, God, it will absolutely affect the way you live. And honestly, if you have any religious background, then it has affected the way you live because that's what religion does. And Jesus doesn't like religion. Jesus came to turn religion on its head. And people say that Christianity is a religion, right? Well, it's, it's you know, we say, well, it's not a religion, it's a relationship, you know. It's, it's, it's so interactive, so interpersonal, the, the relationship that we have with the Father and what Jesus modeled for us in his relationship with the Father. And he's like, if you just get this revelation of the truth right, then all the rest of it's going to fall into place. And we'll see if I have time, but my Galatians 5 scripture comes to mind right now, right? That as we, as we yield passionately to the purposes of the Holy Spirit in our life, that we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh naturally not fulfill the lust of the flesh when we let the spirit have his way in our lives first john 4 7 through 12 beloved let us love one another this is the like a transition thought transition scripture let us love one another for love is from god and everyone who loves is born of god and knows god the one who does not love does not know god for god is love Reminds us of the scripture a little bit ago that says that if you say you know God and you don't love, then you're a liar. And the light and the truth is not even in you because it's so, it is so much his nature and character. The one who does not love, does not love, does not know God for God is love. But this is the love God was, but this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, say substitute, like, uh, uh, atonement, pay the price, propitiation, pay the price. This is the payment for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. He's like, you know what? God, God hasn't made himself physical and tangible and visible except through you. And if you love one another, then people get to see what God's really like. Awesome. That you get to be the model so that people see that this is the very essence and nature of this God that we serve. So it left me to think, right? Uh, people know Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages. A lot of people are familiar with that. Well, these are the five love languages. And I just thought, well, what's exactly God's love language? So you got gift giving, acts of service, words of affirmation, physical touch, quality time. It's a really cool book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's really good. It helps us to know how we receive love and know how those that we care about, how they hear I love you. Because sometimes it's different than the way we say I love you. It's really cool, right? But what, what is it about the nature of God? What is his love language? How do you think God expresses his love? I think, I think it's all of the above, don't you? Isn't there a letter E that says all of the above on there, right? God's love language is because he expresses his love in all of these ways in all of our lives. And some in a particular way because he knows how he's made you. And he pours it out and that's going to have that extra little spark in the way God demonstrates his love towards you. We had a really awesome yay God about God physically and tangibly giving an expression of his love to someone this morning. And it changes you, changes you because this is who he really is. This is, this is welcome, and let me introduce you to truth. And it'll change you, it has to change you. Number three, how do we demonstrate God's love? So how do we demonstrate God's love? So love and obedience are interchangeable, but there's still something missing, right, in my in my in my grabbing this and owning this or something, I'm still thinking about, okay, well, I'm trying to obey and I'm trying to do it right. 
because, you know, I want to be a good person and I don't want God to be displeased with me. And I'm still going to just, I'm just going to try harder to be a better person today than I was yesterday. It's all, that's all good. I mean, I, I want to hang out with good people who are trying to be good. I, I think that's awesome. That's, that's good rather than people who are trying to be bad. I, I think that's awesome. It's just not where God's inviting us to, but it's better than, it's better than the alternative, right? What do they say is the sincerest form of flattery? Imitation. Emulation. Right? If I copy you, it's an emulation. I was going to use as an illustration if he'd been here this morning. We, we have a young man who, who comes and he, and he looks like someone who has influ- had influence in his life. Right? He looks like a, a, a sometimes, looks like a, a, resembles a famous pop music singer. And, and it's it's the sincerest form of flattery when we emulate someone else. And God's saying, would you, would you, like, this is the sincerest form of worship. This is the sincerest form of communication with the Father is emulation. Would you emulate me, God's saying. Would you, would you just emulate me? So these are some thoughts. It's kind of a lot on a slide, but these were my, my thoughts last night. God's commands, God's commands are not just what God does. God's commands are reflections of who he is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? Because he is truth. It is who I am. We are to discover the truth of who he really is. Walk in truth until your path is flooded with the light of the revelation of who he is. And be forever changed by that revelation demonstrate the revelation of the truth about his nature by the most sincere form of worship which is emulation emulation I know that's a lot on one slide but think about it just for a sec God's commands are not just what God does God's commands are reflections of who he is when he gives us an instruction he's just given us an insight into who he is when he says thou shalt not lie It's because he is truth, and there is no falsehood in him. God's not a man that he should lie. He's absolutely truth. So when he says, thou shalt not lie, he's saying, thou shalt be like me, always in the truth, always walking in the truth. Emulate me. When he says, thou shalt not steal, God's saying, because I don't steal, I create. I don't steal, I give. I have everything that there is to give, and my kids have everything that's mine, because you're my kids. And the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. Why would I steal from anything or anyone? Would I steal honor from someone else by, by not extending and giving honor where it's due? Would I take your stuff because somehow I think that I don't have enough stuff? What would I... Why in the world would I ever steal if I come from a place of abundance? So God says, remember that you come from a place of abundance. Remember whose kids you are. Remember and know who I am that created all this in five days. You know, we get worried about what's going on politically, geopolitically in the world. Might help us to remember that God created all this in five days. And that was just because he wanted to make, you know, he just wanted to have everything for a day and then have a day of rest. He just made it all. It's not like he couldn't have done it in a day, couldn't have done it in a moment. But this is the God that we serve. That, that these political figures or big tech or whatever, that they, that they have this, that every breath that George Soros takes, every breath that Bill Gates takes, every breath that Joe Biden takes comes from whom? You think he's intimidated by any of these, you know, anybody, anywhere? But is he intimidated by Pol Pot or the, or or any figure that's ever been, or Joseph Stalin, or, or, Karl Marx, or, you know, like, is there anybody that God is intimidated by and couldn't just say, okay, I'm taking my breath back? Who's who's who do we need to keep our eyes on? (laughs) Who's really in charge? The one. Doesn't have anything to do with the message, but. God did it all in just just days. 
and created all this amazing and beautiful order that we get. And what was the purpose? Again, Romans 1 and 2. He says, I w- I've revealed my nature and my character by that which I've created. And by studying that which I've created, you get greater revelation of who I really am. And God gives us commands simply to give us insights into who he really is. And when he says, I want you to obey me, he's saying, I want you to just emulate who I am. In fact, I want you to be me in the earth. I want you to, I want you to so, and the, and the highlight of it all is God so loved the world. That all of the ways and the individual ways that he showed and took on the form of a servant and he serves us and he lays down his life for us is all an expression, just how he expresses love. And then he says to you, emulate me by showing that love to one another because it's who I am it's because it's my nature and my character and so commandments are not a drudgery and do better because you're not being a good enough person doggone it you need to you need to do a bit more penance and you need to confess just a little bit more you need to push that penny on on the up the mountain for another millennia in order to atone for all of the rottenness and choices that you've made and God says I've I've sent my son to pay the price for all that I so love the world that I gave I want you to know who I really am and that revelation will change us must change us and the way that we live and the way we walk it out we are to discover the truth for who he really is the truth as a person Walk in truth until your path is flooded with light. I think I have that scripture. It's First John, I think. So your path is flooded with the light of the revelation of who he is. So it says when we walk in truth, then, our, then we are filled with light. Our path is illuminated as we just walk in what we, what we know of revelation of his nature and of his truth. As we walk in that, it's just like the Holy Spirit comes in and indwells that. And then makes our path it like brings illumination about i was just doing it because i knew it was the right thing to do so i just did it until revelation came about why i was doing it to begin with but i just trusted in the process and i just did like a like a child responding to his and trusting in his father and out of that brings a revelation that changes me when i see the light and the truth demonstrate the revelation of the truth about his nature by the most sincere form of worship and that is emulation obedience is how we love and worship Yahweh we reflect back to him his own nature and language of love demonstration is emulation love is obedience but obedience is not necessarily love you know I can I can obey and I can try to do the right thing but God wants us God's inviting us to something deeper and more rich and more meaningful than just doing the right thing. I can obey and do the and obey the rules and miss out on what God's really inviting me to. He's saying the rules are simply reflections of who I am. I'm just giving you, you know, I'm just giving you in a succinct way an insight into who I am. And the more that you know that, back to Galatians 5, the more you know that, the more you embrace that, the more you receive that spirit inside, the more revelation and illumination there is, and the more naturally all that other stuff falls away. Because why am I messing with all that other stuff? Because in my bonehead mind, I think that there's something that I need to get fulfillment of over here because I think I'm empty over here because I don't know how rich and amazing and full God's love is towards me. So I'm over here being stupid because I, because I haven't gotten the revelation. And if we'll just walk in obedience till the Holy Spirit brings illumination, then we get to walk in all that blessing that he has for us. I have a couple more scriptures on that thought. Maybe I don't. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. One of the opening scriptures. His commandments aren't burdensome. Because it's relationship. Okay, so I don't have the other scriptures I thought I had. So, in closing, I really am going to close. What do you have faith to believe God for? What do you have faith to believe God for? The reason I just slightly changed direction here, but (coughs) there's some pretty big 
monumental events that have happened in this last week and depending on your perspective they can be really discouraging or I suppose really encouraging <coughs> if you might look up the like I think um, the Joe Biden signed like 20, 20 executive orders like his first day you might look at what those are and if you agree with all those things then then you're probably happy right it's, then that's that's yeah, that's a good thing but but if you don't agree with those and don't represent your value it might be really troubling so that's part of the reason why i included these next couple of scriptures <coughs> it's a beautiful scripture romans 8 31 through 39 so this scripture came i was watching uh, i like to watch when i can the dutch sheet dutch sheets is take 15 so dutch sheets is a a, a speaker author um prophet that I really respect and he does this little 15 thing and he, he gets our eyes back on Jesus and then he, we, we agree in prayer and then he makes a decree at the end of every day and so he does this every day I think he's on day 80 or something now and and this scripture was referenced in yesterday's um, take 15 what then shall we say to these things if God is for us who is against us he who did not spare his own son, but delivered, delivered him over for us all, how will he not also, with him, freely give us all things? Who will bring charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is on the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. What's that saying? It's saying Jesus isn't doing any con con condemning. He's interceding for us. Don't. Mis don't misunderstand what Christ's role is. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us and the last line got cut off separate us from the from the love of God nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God so I thought that as a as a as a way to leave us out of here this morning a scripture to charge us out of here with our eyes back on the one who gives breath to everyone to keep our eyes on the one who is not dismayed about anything going on and that if you're one who is in discouragement and has, has had your hope or your faith, then the question again is, what do you have faith to believe God for? If this is who he is and this is what he says and he has your back, absolutely has your back, no matter who's in office, no matter what happens politically, you know, what happens geopolitically, you know, what happens in the world economy and the world political realm, no matter how clever the enemy is and how how thorough his tactics and effective his tactics seem to be. Remember who it is that keeps it all together. Remember who it is who gives every breath that every one of them take. And I was really kind of convicted and challenged in our men's breakfast last Tuesday because we had a little bit of political conversation and then we went in and we were in Romans chapter 3. And then one of our men um, at the end of Bible study did what I what I wasn't in, even on my mind to do and that is, is that he prayed for the salvation of of our he prayed for the salvation of Joe Biden and his family prayed blessing over him and his family and if you heard that from a scripture just a little bit ago in first Timothy about how we're to engage one another with gentleness and kindness why because that if we engage and we represent God and we keep our eyes on the ball right, that the Holy Spirit can bring revelation and repentance and right relationship to truth. And that right relationship with truth might actually save their life, might actually bring them to a place of true repentance and change because it's the same for all of us. If we get a revelation of he who is truth, it changes us. I know that when I go to the edge of the building and you're, hands on the small of my back, pushing me, right? I'm going to, that truth is going to affect the way that I respond to that. And God's saying, would you just let the revelation and the truth of who I am, would you let that, would you let that just explode into your life? 
as we respond purposefully and passionately to the Holy Spirit's work in our life, we don't, we naturally don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It changes us. God, would you just open our eyes? And we had that prayer in the beginning. First thing she did is lay hands on your eyes. Right? God, would you just help me see? Because I want to see. I want to see you for who you really are. Because all this other stuff, I know it doesn't work. I know it's all broken. I know it's all counterfeit. I don't want to. I, I don't want to live in there, but it's kind of become comfortable, right? Because it's it's kind of what I've turned to. And God's just saying, "What you? Would you just let me bring revelation of who I really am? My commandments are not about just obey because I said so. My commandments are: Would you, would you, see these instructions, commandments? Would you see these as the opportunity to know me more? And that as you know me more, and that truth explodes into your life and into your spirit you're going to walk in truth your path is going to get filled with light and what did jesus say he said that your joy may be full and you're going to walk in joy because it was already pre-done it was already preordained two thousand years before you even breathed god says i forgive you his grace is sufficient his mercy is overwhelming his love is is scandalous and he, and he demonstrates it to us through service and love and by obeying himself and invites us to emulate him, the sincerest form of flattery to emulate him and to show that love for him by love for one another. And, you know, we had a... It's easy to love one another when we're lovable, isn't it? Doesn't count. You don't get any credit for loving each other when you're all lovable. Where you get credit is when we're not lovable and we still love each other. Because that's just what God did. Because it's just who he is. When he says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That God so loved the world that he gave. It's again a revelation of his nature and character. So if you have a difficulty in in your horizontal relationships... The only way we walk through that and learn how to love that way is by getting a revelation of how much we're loved that way. And that if he said, I forgive you before I even did it and before I even asked, then I can do the same for you. And God can do such amazing things with that, people willing to be that model, that demonstration of love, the demonstration of the love that he had for us. Amen? Amen. That's all I got. That's all I got. So.